All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our uh, second media understanding workshop. Um, <clears throat> as you all know, we experimented with a, a different format this time. So throughout the week, there have been uh, five roundtables, which I've heard um, wonderful reports back about. I know the, the roundtable I sat in on was, was a very inspiring conversation. And so um, Today's agenda. Today's agenda here, we're going to basically think of this as sort of like a roundup of all the roundtables, um, you know, lightning talks from each group to sort of go over what uh, was talked about in their session. And um, we have about 20 minutes for each group and a little bit of leeway because we have like a 10 minute break built in for us to you know, get up from our desks for a second, hopefully, and <laughs> stretch out, not get totally exhausted. Um, but so in that 20 minutes, like if we could keep the presentations kind of quick and snappy um, and then leave some room for discussion among the, the broader group, that would be great. Um, yeah, so we're recording the workshop today so that uh, folks that couldn't attend it can come back and, and see um, what we've talked about. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to hear um, the the results of all these wonderful conversations and, and everything that's go been going on this week. So yeah, I guess I don't really have anything else. I was going to save some time for Shri to, to say a few words, but um, I believe that he is not here yet. So um, maybe we should just dive right in. And uh, Dylan, I think you're the first one up talking yes. about taxonomies for relationships and interactions. Yes. Um, yes. So, hi, uh, my name is Dylan. I'm a software engineer on the ethical AI team at Google. Um, and I had the pleasure of facilitating a discussion. Um, hosted by Agatha Lapiez, not Pedriza, sorry. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to, I guess, give a little bit of an overview of what we talked about in the discussion and then hopefully open it up. So next slide. So the overall idea here is thinking about situations in which we might want to compute and classify interactions between people and how we might taxonomize those relationships. So I guess to sort of get you thinking in the background, like in what situations might we want to be like classifying interactions between people? Um, what factors might be important in understanding these interactions? And what kinds of things can we perceive and measure in interactions between people? Um, some examples that like come to my mind, for example, is like in a situation where you might want to have automated photography and automatically take pictures or short gifts of people in front of a camera based on the things that they're doing. Um, it might be important to know like what kinds of things a person might want to have pictures of and then being able to understand like what's going on in front of the camera. Like, is this two people hugging? Is it a parent playing with their kid? Is it, you know, somebody doing jumping jacks or a flip or, you know, understanding, is there something, you know, sentimental or sweet or positive going on? Uh, you might want to understand like the actions and the dynamics of the people in front of the camera. Um, another situation might be like toxicity modeling in chat. You want to find out is the conversation, you know, happening between these two people in a chat room, you know, positive? Is it negative? Is something abusive happening? Um, and it could be useful to understand the dynamic between the two people. If you want to understand, you know, if somebody says, oh, you're such a jerk, it's important, you know, if you know these two people have been friends for 20 years, it could be, you know, perceived as far less toxic than two people who just met and there's a power dynamic between them, you know, totally, totally changes how you think about toxicity modeling. Um, so then some factors that you might think about here, um, like are there power dynamics happening? Is there something like maybe a spectrum between cooperative and competitive? Thinking about like 
aspects of identity that might play into thinking about power relations, you know, gender or, you know, skin tone or race or language or, you know, is there some kind of institutional dynamic? Is this a parent and a child? Is it a teacher and a student? Um, so lots of different sort of ways of thinking about classifying like different aspects of relationships between people. And then finally, what kinds of things can we perceive and measure in a particular use case? So like, are you looking at someone? Are you reading text exchanges between people? Do you just have audio of people? Um, maybe if you have, you know, all the sensors in the world and you have a perfect representation of two people interacting, do you know their heart rate? Do you know their skin conductivity? You know, what kinds of things could a computer perceive that a person might not be able to? Um, so this is just sort of like things you might want to have in the back of your head um, as we go into like the topics that we covered. So next slide. So first, one of the key things that we talked about was um, the choices that we make in taxonomizing relationships and interactions define the output space that we're going to have, which I think is something that's pretty intuitive, but also really important to think about. Like, the labels that we choose to use, the things we choose to measure, you know, the types of structures that we choose to build will define what kinds of answers we get, what kind of decisions that we make. Next slide. So then I guess hand in hand with that, thinking about what kinds of applications might these systems be used for? Um, what is this taxonomy serving? What purpose is it serving? Is this something that's being surfaced explicitly? For example, you know, we noticed that women speak 50% less than men in this situation, and we're going to tell you that statistic outright, versus a taxonomy that maybe is being used to inform future behavior, you know, in robotics or something being used to like make a decision that we're then going to sort of like iterate on or continue to sort of make decisions moving forward from that point. Um, and then is this a taxonomy meant to uncover biases? Um, and are there ways in which it might either have some kind of like positive feedback loop or even you know negative feedback loop? Can these taxonomies be used to reinforce or mitigate biases? So for example, if you're looking at you know gender dynamics between people seeing like, Oh, we noticed that you know women are speaking 50% less than men in this situation. And so we're going to, you know, surface that. We're going to use that to sort of change how this thing is built. We're going to use that to change policy. Um, next slide. <laughs> so then another layer um, is thinking about affect and the social dimensions of affect here. So thinking like specifically in the realm of like effective computing, um, how are how might emotions play into understanding relationships and interactions between people and that like one's emotion isn't necessarily like intrinsically or only social, um, but inherently have some kind of social component, like the ways in which emotions might inform or be sort of in response to or used to communicate to other people in your surroundings. Next slide. And then finally, um, we spent a lot of time talking about top-down versus bottom-up up approaches to creating these taxonomies. Um, so for example, is it better to define some really broad space and then as you have an application, maybe select some subset of this space to use for this context? Um, which could have the benefits of like, you know, you can have, be thinking about a really wide range of applications and maybe even have, you know, labels that you might not immediately consider to use in a space being applied because you are thinking about it in, you know, relation to something completely different, sort of some kind of cross pollination of ideas and, you know, many other potential benefits of a top down approach um, versus thinking about things from a bottom up sort of bespoke defining taxonomies for really specific applications and sort of catering these taxonomies to exactly what you 
are hoping to achieve in this specific context. Um, we are thinking about ways in which you might accept sort of the biases in the data or accept biases in the world um, in defining your taxonomies versus enforcing some kind of top level idea of, you know, this is the world as we would like it to be, or this is the world as we are like hoping to sort of like propagate out or enforce. Um, something that came up is that it's very easy to enforce priors, um, especially in a top-down approach, because you might not be thinking about or taking into consideration really specific details about some particular application when you're defining this really broad taxonomy um, and you know, not take into account really important factors um, when you're applying it sort of in some application. So, you know, for example, if you're thinking about, you know, gender detection, you know, you might use a binary gender classifier for some really, really broad spectrum of uses. And then, you know, in one particular setting, not taking into account, you know, gender non-conforming people, people who aren't going to be picked up by some automated system or labeled by labelers in an accurate way um, might like really, really affect the outputs in some particular application that it might actually not in some other application. Um, and you know, loads of other potential examples there. And then finally, like how does one even define interactions between people to begin with? So an example is like, you know, if you have two people you know, sitting in a room, does making eye contact count as an interaction or is it only when someone starts to speak or only when someone, you know, turns towards the other person? Like where you define those lines is a really important place, I think, to start in understanding like how you're gonna build your taxonomy. Um, next slide. Yeah, so these are just sort of some, some really broad questions. Um, that I was thinking of and sort of that were percolating up in discussion. And I would love to hear uh, anyone's thoughts or Agatha, if you wanted to add anything that I may have missed. Um, I just wanted to open it up to discussion. Thank you so much, Dylan. Um, and yeah, please Agatha jump in at any moment. But I did want to just say like, um, if anyone wants to speak, feel free to just come off of mute and, and jump in, or there's a raise hand feature um, in Meet. Um, also, feel free to use the chat if you um, feel more comfortable just uh, putting a question in the chat. One of us will uh, read it or, or respond to it for sure. So. I have a quick question. Um, so re regarding this discussion, did you have any particular type of media in mind, uh, any typical platform, or is it more of a generic uh, discussion on taxonomy? Yeah, I, I can say it, it was more generic. It was more like a generic discussion on, on you know. so on the idea, so, so somehow it's like, when you when you expect a machine learning system to understand a social interaction, for instance, that you see in a video, yeah, the, the idea was around what type of, of categories we should we should consider um, in general. Yeah. Hey, <clears throat> hey, Agatha Dylan, uh, it's great uh, discussion. Um, I just wanted to add, bring up a point of discussion that we keep uh, in, in our work with uh, visual ambience for videos come, uh, keeps coming up. Um, the idea of, uh, for most things, how um, there's a structural component and a functional component to taxonomy. Um, in the example you gave where uh, is uh, a person making eye contact interaction, um, we thought like one of the ways to kind of uh, organize it is by looking at um, structurally what is happening there, as well as eye contact would be a way of interaction, but also functionally, what is it serving, which varies a lot more depending on context. And so I wanted to kind of bring that up. And if you had any thoughts on that. I, I think this is a great point uh, to see this, these two perspectives and, and what you just said. So I think that 
basically the 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 goal of the round table it's not it's it's a very it, it was a very open discussion because i think that at this moment the field of categorizing social interactions is not mature enough so that we we know what is the best taxonomy to use it's different if we think of other recognition problems like object detection, right, or, or object categorization. So everyone knows that if you go to ImageNet categories, you have like a list of objects that we all the community accepts as the as the good um, taxonomy. But but in this space is is much more ambiguous, and and there are like multiple dimensions that you can take a look at. So so the idea maybe was to bring some thoughts, bring some questions that that hopefully can be useful, you know to start approaching and to start um, thinking of how to define these type of taxonomies that, that are useful and meaningful for the applications that, that we have in mind. I wonder if you have any other, um, you know, examples of those applications sort of, I, I know Dylan shared kind of the, the smart photography kind of example um which sort of makes a lot of sense but yeah i'm just sort of curious what other applications are are coming to mind for for really understanding human interactions in media yeah we were thinking on, on the bias analysis for sure right in understanding so if, if you categorize the type of interactions and you also know something about the demographics of the people that are interacting and you notice some differences depending on the demographics that's one that's one point and then another thing that came into the discussion was this paper that that Shri uh, recently shared with us about the interruptions in the meetings right because and, and this was like one example of a, of, of a very specific task about in, uh, understanding the interactions right so understanding interactions is very broad but one example of, of a very concrete problem is, can you detect an interruption? And, and we were saying, okay, what is an interruption, right? So interruption, it means that, you know, it's kind of a transition between one speaker and the other speaker, then it's, it's not a natural transition, right? So it's like the second speaker started earlier than expected, right? So in that case, uh, this is, this is a, an example of a specific understanding of the interaction that is very concrete. And maybe here you don't need like a very large taxonomy or anything too complex, right? Because the setting is already very bounded. So you, you have just to, or uh, some people speaking and what you want to understand is when there is a transition be between one speaker and the other speaker, it is a, a, an interruption, yes or not. So maybe you don't need anything else, right? Um, so yeah, th this is another example um, that, that came into the discussion. I see you have your hand up, Jed. Yeah, thank you both for um, particularly some very evocative and thought-provoking questions. I, I wanted to ask an intentionally simplistic question um, as a point of contrast, but um, I'm particularly looking at um, your second question, and I'm left wondering if you if if how interactions between people contrast with interaction between a person and an object came up in your conversation at all. And I'm left wondering just like, what's shifting? What are like, what are the key things we need to be thinking about if it's two people rather than just a person and an object? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great question. I think that when the interaction is among two people, the, 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 the taxonomization is a little bit more complex because you have um, a lot of extra categories in the social domain, right? So when, it, when the, the interaction is between two people, there's a social component. While if the interaction is between a person and an object, you don't have such a social component because it's just one of the agents that are social. The object is not social, right? But still, uh, there there are some some domains like the affective domain. This is something that we also discussed. And and thinking of the affective domain, so the simpler way of of thinking of that is, imagine you have an interaction and you just want to classify this interaction in positive or negative right from the emotional perspective right so this is something that can be social but still is something that you can have in an interaction between a person and an object right because you can be interacting with an object and have uh, and and you, you 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 can be having like a positive or a negative experience right and if we if you think for instance in the application of bias uh, analysis on on how let's say females and males are represented for instance 
and this is a, this is very interesting, right? Because um, when when you observe, I mean, when you have examples of females interacting with certain objects or people, yeah, females interacting with certain objects and males interacting with certain objects, is there a difference on the affect how how they interact? Do, I don't know. Do you see females uh, feeling more or less comfortable when interacting with technology in comparison with males? And does it reflect some societal bias? So. Um, I think there are differences in, 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 in the um, relationship between or, or interactions between objects and, and people and, and two people because of the social component, but still um, you can characterize the interaction of a person with an object in a very rich and complex way. I mean, in, in full disclosure, you were talking about interruptions and then I kept getting these notifications popping up on my screen and I was like, these are interrupting me. And if we adopt the position that, you know, technology is an expression of people's social values, developers' values, um, then and the, I, think, I think it's really interesting to then say, okay, but then what are we still missing that, you know, is maybe the affective component experienced by the other person? And that might be a helpful way of us putting boundaries around what the taxonomy is or how the how taxonomies might compare between those two scenarios. Anyway, this is great. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I had a question if we still have time. Um, yeah, I don't yeah, know when yeah. we're supposed to switch. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, about this idea of like how big should the taxonomy be? How broad do we want it to be if we're just if we just care about detecting interruptions? Do we just need to know about interruptions or do we need to encode more information about the world to like understand? I guess you could go two ways. You could say like, I need to know more encoded knowledge about different types of interruptions. Like, oh, it's an interruption, but like, it's because we're both really excited and we're like, it's not a negative interruption, right? It's just like, oh, I'm finishing each other's sentences and we're like jiving, right? Um, or it's like, a negative interruption and I was trying to speak and you're stepping on me, right? Um, and then on the other side, there's like, okay, it wasn't an interruption, but what was it, right? Do we just need a like big category of other or like not? Or does it help to understand more if we know what it is versus what it isn't? And yeah, I'm interested if people know of, of work exploring that or or have thoughts about which things work work better from like a technology standpoint or a more more meaning learning standpoint? Okay, maybe I can bring some thoughts here. <laughs> so, uh, well, actually, we have, uh, yeah, we have some. People commenting in the chat. Uh, should we? I mean, you can just unmute yourself. And <laughs> sorry, it was Jed. Um, Susanna, I th one of the things you're describing is a linguist call um, cooperative overlapping. Um, and I ran into this because, like, there's, like, uh, it's particularly common in um, Jewish culture. Um, and so there, this like ran around the social media and people being like, "Oh, I'm not being rude." It's cooperative overlapping, um, but it's a linguistic style um, where like interruptions can mean different things in different cultural contexts based on linguistic style. Yeah, did you Jed beat me to it. I just dropped a similar link. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you oh, have thanks. any last thoughts before we move on, Agatha? Uh, so, so maybe just about Susanna's comments, I think, um, so we also discussed about this idea of um, can we have like some kind of uh, hierarchical taxonomy where, you know, we have like a first level and then start being more fine grain if we want, right? So that th this is this is definitely interesting. I think that it's it's good to be as fine grain as you want, but then if you if you also think in the modeling, uh, right? So So hopefully, I mean, you want this taxonomy to to build this machine learning system that can um, uh, compute the inference right of the different categories. So the the more fine grained your, ta your taxonomy is, the more complex your problem is as well. So I think that there, there is a trade off here, right? I mean, it's good to be as fine grained as possible, but sometimes you just need to start with the with the first level of the you know 
the, the first easier binary problem. Um, but it depends on the application. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you all. That was a wonderful. I just refreshed the deck because um, I had a request. I feel like some people were editing the deck <laughs> while we were talking. Um, let's see. Let me get this back up. And we'll move on to the next presentation, which is uh, Tanaya's group, I believe, on uh, character networks for interaction modeling. Um, yes. As my computer stops being slow, I'll get you onto the right slide. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What is going on here? Um, Amrita, if you just want to start, I can I can get this slide. Up okay. Uh, I sort of made a couple of slides, so. Um, okay. Um, give me one second. Um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Amrita. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Sale. I work with Sri, and uh, I'm going to be summarizing the discussion that we had, which was hosted by Tanaya, um, who's a Dr. Tanaya Guha, who's a prof at uh, Warwick University. Um, and it was on character networks for interaction modeling. Thanks, Kree. <laughs> um, uh, can you go to the next slide? Um, so as we all know, um, we want models that are character-centric uh, to understand media. And um, for this characterizing, like understanding dynamic models of interactions is important. Um, ca how characters interact with each other is crucial. And uh, we pretty much talked about, uh, can we move beyond co-occurrences uh, and just counting? Um, and how do we quantify strength of interaction? How to detect interaction along dimensions like power? victim perpetrator, emotional expressions, et cetera. And uh, for this, obviously, we have uh, movie making has different processes, processes involved, uh, which starts from writing the script, uh, creating the script, um, getting actors involved. Uh, and it goes through a variety of stages. And it's sort of important uh, to be able to characterize uh, how these things change as well. Um, and next slide, please. Um, what we have found out so far is character graphs are really useful for this task. Uh, we want to answer summative questions like how important is a character? What are the relationships between different characters? And what, what ML has been able to do so far is like measure representation statistics like screen time, speaking time, try to discover social roles of characters, um, try to uh, understand character interactions that are around uh, major events in storytelling and comparing media stories and segments using you know, subgraph matching or some other met methods. Um, next slide, please. So what we ideally would like to have is something like this, which is taken from a um, um, comics. Uh, here, this is like hand-drawn uh, of like the Lord of the Rings trilogy and like um, what the different character arcs, arcs are, what are the different interactions. Uh, but this is really different from what we actually are able to achieve. Um, next slide. So this is a hand-coded um, social network uh, from this movie graph database. And here you can see there are like um, annotations of race, gender, uh, different affective attributes, when do they appear on screen, what are the kinds of interactions that they are having, et cetera. And obviously this is not really scalable because it, this is like, this takes a lot of effort to go in and hand annotate. Um, next slide. Um, these are some of the character graphs that we are able to automate, automatically generate. Um, these are two different works. Um, one of them uses um, video analysis and face clustering, uh, and the other one 
uh, uses script parsing. There are a couple of different methods in this direction. Next slide. Um, but obviously what we want is to characterize uh, interactions beyond simple co-occurrences. Uh, just because two characters appear on screen together or speak at the same time um, does not mean that they have a stronger interaction. Um, so what we want is to get like a higher abstraction from simple co-occurrences. We want to characterize um, meaningful interactions. Uh, one of the questions that we talked about was, is ML there yet? Like, can we move uh, beyond like a set of hierarchical set of rules? Um, one of the bigger issues with ML is also that we are not able to look at larger context and uh, different granularities between different data streams. Um, for instance, in the video domain, we want to be able to look beyond faces and facial expressions, look at body gestures, and uh, we want to be able to look at that with like what's going on in the speech domain. Maybe there are some co-references uh, uh, happening uh, in the text domain, and we need to be able to comprehensively look at this. Um, next slide. So uh, one of the main things that we talked about was how to characterize dimensions like, say, power. And uh, one aspect of this would be representation. And um, obvious, one of the uh, things that I guess everybody is interested in is like, what is the ratio of like uh, different demographics, different uh, gender uh, ratios in movies? And how does that uh, affect the script? How does that affect the storyline? Um, also, does rep representation change before a content is before and after a content is produced, like in the production of a movie, uh, how do characters uh, change? Uh, one of the things that we talked about is uh, very similar to the inter interruption work. Uh, to look at othering language, like us versus them. Are people collaborating or uh, competing in a very coarse sense? And uh, we're not just talking about identity. Uh, like, it's also do you consider like some interaction as like us versus other? And uh, there's there's some work in NLP that looks at this looks at this specifically. But uh, one of the things we talked about was can we um, characterize any interaction that they have as like are they competing with each other or collaborating with each other? Um, next slide, please. Um, again. Another thing that ML, like, you know, we are all working on is incorporating how to effectively encode information from different streams that are happening at different rates. Um, for instance, say we have a graph from video analysis and a graph from analyzing the script. Uh, how do you merge these things? Um, scene graphs are another tool that gives us a lot of low level interactions. And um, are we able to add more att attributes to these characters from, say, the script? If we already know um, who are the important characters, can we encode that in these graphs? And how would these graphs change with the prior knowledge? Um, next slide. Um, another important thing we talked about was like how this content gets perceived. And looking at that as like a different view of the same problem uh, as content creation. Um, these days, content is getting tailored to uh, different audiences. Uh, so there is a segmentation of audience with like personalization by platforms like Netflix. And uh, we thought of like, what if we come up with a perception experiment? Like, for instance, can we create custom tailors and show it to like different demographics of people? Um, and the sampling can be done in like different ways. Researchers could sample this ourselves. It can be automatically selected by an ML algorithm, or maybe audience does it in forms of like audience select these things. They select certain scenes and these get uploaded to like movie forums or YouTube, or the industry selects based on different trailers that get released in different parts of the world. And uh, one other dimension that we wanted to talk about was how to get people to watch content that they might not want to, like they might stick to like a particular style of things. And uh, we might ideally want these movies to appeal to that demographic. So uh, this experiment might be important in that aspect as well. Um, next slide, please. 
So these are the broad takeaways uh, from the talk. Um, the first one goes back to the last last talk, I think. Uh, we need a taxonomy for these relationships because the search space is too large. Uh, there are shortcuts ways of trying to get to the taxonomy, but those are not really complete. Um, and we need ML methods that can model complex relationships beyond fancy counting. Uh, we need methods to benchmark some of these ML efforts. Uh, so annotations uh, or like these kind of relationships are not really encoded in a nice manner. So we might need to have a database uh, that can help us benchmark some of these methods we come up with. Fusing information from variable sources and modalities is like an ongoing research area. And uh, perception of content is just as important as content creation. And it might need to be factored in for effective analysis of complex relationships. Um, thanks, everyone. Any questions? I, I feel like I went through that too fast. I, I think that was a uh, perfect pacing. <laughs> Don't feel that way at all. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I mean, I guess I can I can start us off since I unmuted myself. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I really like the you know call out of you know fusing information from variable sources and modalities. It's definitely something that we're thinking a lot about um, these days. Um, and I think like maybe an interesting you know thing. Uh, you know, to just get your sort of reactions to or sort of like, you know, trying to figure out kind of like, like what, like aspects of, you know, information can we sort of like reliably get from different modes, right? Like, you know, there's all this research that we kind of laugh at, but it keeps, you know, coming out of people like, you know, doing uh, face classification algorithms to detect your like political party affiliation or something, you know, which is completely, you know, nonsensical, right? But if someone were to say, hey, I'm, you know, uh, you know, I don't know, a libertarian, I'm just like trying to think of a non standard <laughs> political party here. But, um, uh, you know, then then you could sort of reliably assert that that is is true, right? Rather than just like looking at their face. And so I guess I, you know, just sort of like thinking about how, you know, how do we sort of make those assertions that like we shouldn't be trying to get this, you know, like classification or attribute from this modality, but it's okay to do it in this other modality, you know, and how do we kind of like, start to make those decisions about which modes we should be sort of looking at for which, you know, bits of information. Um, Tanaya, would you? Thanks, Amruta. First, first of all, thanks for presenting our discussion in such an organized and compact manner. Um, so to, cre to answer uh, Cree's, uh, not, not really answer question, but just to add to that thought, uh, this is what we talked about a lot because we had in our group people doing video analysis, audio analysis, and NLP. So we acknowledge that each modality has its strengths and weaknesses. So definitely we should be looking at how to best complement each other. Uh, and some of the modalities may be more rewarding to process in terms of complexity, in terms of what you can get. Uh, while others can be more difficult. For example, video can always be more com complex, uh, but they, they will also have more subtle information that is probably not mentioned in movie scripts. Um, and we also talked about getting metadata or maybe reviews from IMDb or Rotten Tomatoes, because we our discussion was mostly focused uh, on movies and TV series. So there are usually a lot of uh, fan videos, a lot of uh, wiki pages dedicated to, let's say, each character in Star, uh, Star Trek or a lot of the things. So we were thinking that maybe we could also use some of those information to get better idea of character-character interaction. We did not talk too much about character and environment interaction, which is also important. Uh, as we know, many of the objects that people, are, people use in movies, they become like a cultural icon. So 
those those can also have very long term effects but we didn't get a lot of time to discuss that so we focused mostly on character character interaction and we thought a key would be to have a good uh, taxonomy probably specific to an application and then our best bet will be to combine information coming from different modalities Um, and, and just to add to that, I think we um, like a lot of us felt like text would, for instance, the script. Like if we have access to the script, it would give us like a more comprehensive idea of like character relationships. And I think we also talked about like tone of speech, but um, it's very important to model these uh, carefully because, like for instance, how an actor portrays. A character, um, like depending on the actor casting choice, it would be very different. And I think one other thing that I think Tanaya brought up was, um, say, like a mother talking to a child, um, something that she says might not look as rude as, like, say, a partner talking to some other partner and like the same content. And um, so you raise like a really good point, but. I don't think there is uh, at this point like there's a good answer of which modality um, contributes what. I think it's very context dependent. I think that's another thing that we talked about. Like how do we, how can we factor in context? Because I I think at this point machine learning is not really able to do that. Like we are only able to look at like temporal context and like look at scenes that might occur in the same um, or like a closer to each other, we are not really able to um, like mix and match things that happen in different points of time, for instance. Hi, Sabi. Uh, yes, so I, I wanted to ask, do you think it makes sense to use the text stream to annotate the AV streams? Because it seems as if, uh, again, this might fall into the task of aligning both the screenplay and the audio video frames. But uh, it seemed as if like we do not have enough label data from the audio video data sets to find such complex uh, uh, connections between the fictional uh, characters. So I just wanted to uh, hear, uh, have your thoughts on this. Hi, Sabi. Thanks for the question. I, I think it should be possible in some context. Um, if you have subtitles, we, as you know, we always use it for some weak labels as speaker diarization, and things like that. So this is already there. People are using it. And if you have scripts, probably can be uh, used as description of a video scene. I have seen some databases which have this description of audio and video scene uh, but i'm not sure if that will give us something extra or we'll just not be able to uh, use all the modalities to its full potential because we are kind of limiting some modality by the other i'm not sure i mean it's open for discussion if anyone else has any thought hey tanaya if i'm if i'm add to it um i, I think We've explored some of those uh, these questions, and it's really easy to get to some of the low-level constructs. Things like, is there speech happening, um, or is there a person on screen? Things like that. But high-level cons constructs, like um, uh, going from uh, person a someone somebody's language to what they're doing on screen, is very much of an open problem. Um, but I think exploiting these co-occurring streams is a great place to start. Yeah, I, I agree. Just, just to add, I think we also discussed if there is any possibility we can somehow compare the novels and their adaptation, their movie adaptation for the same thing. Amrita brought it out and of course, there's a lot of differences between the movie adaptation and the novels, but it's it's worth looking at what 
parts gate uh, focused in movies. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to call out one other point that you made in the presentation too about um, the, you know, sort of looking at like power dynamics between characters. I think this is something that I've thought about as well. I, I feel like it's similar to kind of like Agatha's um, point around sort of looking at interruptions as like a nice sort of contained example of like how to get at some of these deeper questions and like those like power dynamics is like another one where I feel like, you know, it's sort of this contained example. It's like, you know, just sort of like trying to classify who's the dominant character and who's the more passive or like submissive character or whatever. And it's like, yeah, there's a lot of great NLP work there, but like, there's probably a lot of really interesting information coming from the visual and audio signals as well that can feed into this. And so I, I've, I've felt like this is this is like a really, really interesting problem that could help to sort of fuse, you know, the, these different sort of modalities and, and try to tackle like, you know, something like concrete in, in this sort of direction. Yes, absolutely. I think that will be very interesting to look at. I have also seen mostly NLP work um, in, in this along these dimensions. Um, Victor, I don't know if he's there. Victor has also done a lot of NLP work on victim uh, perpetrator detection, but haven't seen much work from audio or video side. Uh, some audio work just involves dyadic interaction, which is usually scripted. But if we are talking about media in the wild, then it's it's very difficult to process, highly non-stationary. Uh, we have years of experience struggling with uh, with the audio and the video stream. So, but I think those will be the future directions and uh, the challenges that we should uh, look at. Awesome. Well. Thank you for the presentation and the, the wonderful discussion. And um, I think it's time we uh, move on to the next group, which is the ethics of measuring body size hosted and presented by Carolyn. All right, so we have a team of folks. I'm gonna take a few slides. It, it will look similar to um, what we did earlier in the week in terms of who's collaborating and then pass the baton to Becca Cooper and then pass the baton to uh, Nathan Jones and then we'll pass the baton to Krishna. So um, next slide, please. Uh, the ethics of measuring body size. So this is something that we've uh, at the Gina Davis Institute, we've been uh, focused on for a couple of years. Uh, next slide, please. The reason that we're interested in this is because we look at different systems of power and oppression, right, in terms of representation, which we're all involved with. Um, so we at the Institute focus specifically on representations of race, gender, LGBTQIA+, um, age with a focus on 50 plus, uh, disability with a focus on different types, not just obvious physical disabilities, and last but not least, uh, sizeism or fat phobia. So uh, this is, we view this as a social justice issue because um, the 39% of the American population uh, and 35% of the global population who have a large body type uh, end up reporting very frequent and common um, acts of stereotyping, microaggressions, discrimination, et cetera. And we have some good data that demonstrate that indeed body size is the basis uh, for prejudice um, in the US and in other countries. Uh, next slide, please. So um, just a few sizes and stats. Um, one study uh, from NHS finds that medical fat shaming, um, at, which is uh, folks who are fat or large body type going to a doctor and being shamed about um, their bodies uh, or being misdiagnosed because of their body size actually leads to more deaths um, than uh, the, the uh, very rare instance where body size actually is correlated with health. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, but we know that this discrimination comes up in all 
sorts of domains. For example, it comes up uh, in the criminal justice system with male jurors more likely to convict fat women, um, that fat uh, people are actually learning, are earning less on average. Uh, it's a statistically significant difference. We find that six out of 10 uh, adults face um, employment discrimination based upon their weight, uh, and 45% of women and 28% of men, so more women than men, face harassment and bullying uh, based upon their weight. And this stat is, uh, you know, just searing 85% of fat kids are bullied in school. And then uh, we found a really interesting study that um, parents prefer children who, uh, non-fat children, right? They're uh, less likely to purchase a car for a fat teen than for their other children. So um, this is a kind of a hodgepodge of stats to show you, yes, it's a systemic problem. It's an economic problem. It's a social problem. It's a political problem. Um, and it, it works uh, into all different aspects of uh, a fat person's life. Uh, next slide, please. Myths of fatness. The first is uh, the idea, we have a lot of widely held beliefs about uh, and stigmatization of, of fatness. The first is that fatness is about willpower, not biology. And uh, you know, medical science has landed us uh, in a place where it's very obvious that um, our body shape and our body size um, has much more to do with biology, genetics, and other things that are immutable or relatively immutable um, than it does with choices that we make. And we all actually know this at a kind of a gut level um, because we know that, for example, diets fail. And possibly everybody in this meeting has tried to uh, shift their body size, their body type. It's really difficult to do. I mean, we can go into the science of, of, of what a body, you know, how a body will try to get back to what it is comfortable, its comfortable size. Um, and this ties into myth number two, that people can lose weight by eating less. If that were true, then diets actually would work the way that we believe that many of us believe them to work, but actually bodies process calories very differently and restricting cal calories um, actually can lead to weight gain. Um, and myth number three, and this is the big one, right? That we tend to impugn and stigmatize fatness uh, because we we're, we're sort of like where we were with race back in the 1930s when we were trying to make biological arguments uh, where we were doing cranial studies and those sorts of things. That's where we are with fatness today. Um, the idea that that fat, fatness is uh, equals unhealthy. Um, we have a number of studies and, and in fact, I, I did an update this, but there's one that came out just a few months ago, replicating or close to replicating the 2005 CDC study um, that finds no correlation uh, between weight and death rates. Um, that there is a small percentage of people um, on the very high end who do have a higher likelihood of dying um, and that is in some ways linked to their body size. Um, but like most stereotypes or most myths, there's a kernel of truth, but it ends up um, it ends up stigmatizing or painting the entire group in ways that are not accurate and not fair. Uh, a recent, the recent study that was completed uh, was a blind study where doctors were given uh, patient files and they were not able to determine the body size of the patient based upon the health history and the current health status of the client. Uh, now I'm going to pass the baton to Becca who will talk about the language we use and the tropes and stereotypes that often come up in media representations of fat people. Hi everyone. So before talking about the tool to measure body size, just some language and um, what we're looking for at the Institute in terms of um, fat representation and representations of people with large body types in the media. So to start off, terms to avoid um, obese and morbidly ob obese are terms that they're medical terms and insurance classifications that we avoid um, because they're rooted in BMI, which is a flawed diagnostic tool. Um, and so we avoid those terms and also avoid terms like heavy, plus size, overweight, or non-thin, all of which center thin people as the norm. Um, so instead, in the next slide, um, so these are two terms that are that are okay and safe to use. The first one is a little more complicated. So obviously fat is a word that is stigmatized um, over time and has been used as a slur, but it is actively being reclaimed by the fat acceptance movement and the body positive movement, um, especially by people that do have large body types. Um, so 
the, the term itself though is, is, is slowly being used in ways that are less stigmatized. Um, but after much deliberation and, and talking with our research team and um, advisors, we came to this term at the Institute, which seems to be the, the most stigma free term. So large body type, um, a person having a large body type, that's a stigma free term that also decenters smaller bodies as the norm and places large body types at the norm um, or not at the norm, but it, it flips that and it also accurately suggests that these body types are something that we're, we all have, they're immutable for the most part and not something that are malleable. Um, and in the next slide, we have some examples of tropes. So we're looking for a slew of stereotypes that come up when fat people are in the media. Um, and then a trope refers to a character that is really reduced to those stereotypes. So five examples of some of the most common tropes that come up in media uh, would be first off uh, the comic relief trope. So this is a character whose whole existence in the film or episode is just to provide comic relief. Uh, Mr. Smee in Peter Pan is a really great example of that. Doesn't really serve anything other than to be funny and kind of ridiculous. Um, another common trope we see for people with large body types is the sidekick trope. Actually, Mr. Smee also fits that one. Um, and we put uh, Molly from Booksmart here too. So this is often a supportive buddy or the best friend to a pretty girl. Um, in in Booksmart, you can see that Molly is, all. she kind of plays wing woman for the most part and is there to support her best friend who is thinner. Um, another trope we see often for women with large body types is the mama hen trope. So we have Medea pictured here, but you'll see this everywhere. Um, this is a character that is looked to as the mother of a friend group or uh, looked to to be more maternal or more nurturing or more great, um, better at listening and, and providing support and caretaking than the other thin people in the group. Um, another common trope we see is the nympho trope. So this is a character that is hypersexual, um, sexually vulgar often, and we put bordering on predatory because often the advances are unwelcome. Uh, we see this with uh, Melissa McCarthy's character in Bridesmaid. Uh, she repeatedly makes hilarious but vulgar and cringy um, sexual advances at People, it all, we also see it with Fat Amy in Pitch Perfect. And then lastly, the loser trope, which we're all familiar with. Um, uh, Homer Simpson is a good example of a larger character who is, you know, in this case, drooling, drinking beer, from the unattractive. And oftentimes uh, characters with large body types will be shown wearing the same clothing um, throughout the film. Um, so yeah, those are some of the tropes that we look for. I'm now gonna pass it on to Nathan. Hi. So. I know we're, we're at time. I'm going to try to speed run through these slides. So I'm going to try to say like half of what I say is going to be next slide. It'll be a fun game of Simon Says. So the next slide shows what we uh, do at the Gina Davis Institute. Uh, in our research team, we do human coding, which is where we human watch a film and note all the characters. And we have the 70 question code book about all these different attributes. And on the right is automated analysis. And this next slide will uh, show exactly what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, our automated analysis that's able to watch a movie and uh, generate uh, stat statistics about characters based on their screen time is called the GDIQ. Um, so the next slide is gonna show uh, a question that we asked, which is uh, can we automate this sort of body type classification for characters in both film and TV? Ah, next slide. Uh, so if we look at kind of research for body type uh, machine learning algorithms, kind of the left is what we would expect which is a, a full body size image. And we can kind of look at the body type with the full body. But on the right is what we typically get in films, which is that we're not guaranteed every character will show the full body or even the upper body. We're kind of only guaranteed one thing. And this next slide will show even more examples of what films look like in case you've never seen a film. Um, most of the times, it's, uh, it's not a ton of the body. And the next slide will have this really beautiful transition, which is uh, what we built our uh, algorithm on, which is only the face and the face alone. So. Oh, I'm sorry I'm saying next slide so much. Next slide though. Uh, the goal is that we could automate this sort of body type classification of our characters in film only using the face alone, which is kind of deviating away from what this uh, literature review would suggest, which is kind of we need the full body to do body size. Next slide. Uh, but it's not just body type, because the next slide shows us other sort of areas that we do uh, at the Genius Institute that we would want to sort of automate about a character. So in addition, that means gender, age, and skin tone. And this next slide will show our new objective, which was automating both body type, gender, age, and skin tone classification using the face alone for characters. All right, next, yeah, there we go, perfect. The next slide uh, 
this kind of shows what typical data sets for faces look like. You can see that most of these faces are facing the camera. Uh, they're really clean cut with very minimal uh, amounts of data in the background. But as we know from films, that's not always guaranteed. There's characters in weird lighting and strange angles. And it, it wouldn't be advantageous to train a model and see like we're doing well on this training data and then fail when we actually matters in inference. Another problem with the next slide uh, shows that a lot of times uh, these data sets are really highly imbalanced uh, towards white and male faces. And you can see here, this blue bar is the amount of white faces in these data sets. And it's just so, so much bigger than all the other colors. Um, so the next slide uh, will show that we didn't want to use any of these public data sets. We wanted to make sure that we had a really balanced data set that represented the task. And the next slide has this really beautiful table. I'm very proud of it. Uh, we, we scraped this data set together ourselves using film and TV data. We had our team of researchers who are trained on the code books that we use for human coding uh, annotate all this data. And you can see that we have some really beautiful parity with the US population baseline uh, for gender, uh, for skin tone, for uh, age, and of course, large body type. Uh, we have this really nice balanced data set. All right, next slide. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so uh, normally what we do is we would build out a single algorithm for each of these attributes, one for gender, one for skin tone, so on and so forth. The problem with that on the next slide is that uh, these networks have a lot of information that might be useful to another task. So gender might know something about a face that skin tone would want to also know. But if we do this separately, that's kind of region locked information, which is not great. And the next slide shows this beautiful utopia where all the models are able to share and talk to one another. And that's exactly what we ended up doing with this tool. Uh, so it's called the multitask model. We start with the shared core network and that kind of feeds into all of the tasks. And then it ends up making this prediction that's kind of aware of all the other tasks needs and information. And we get this really nice model. This next slide shows uh, it, it learns information, uh, it shares together and it doesn't overfit or cheat the task at all, which is nice. All right, I'm almost done. The next slide shows the table. Look at all the 90s, beautiful. And the next slide has a demo. We can skip that, but it's interesting to show uh, that this actually works. It's a little video demo. I think it's neat. Okay, thank you for all those next slides. Do we have time for the demo? Yeah, we can, we can play it. Did Oh great. Okay. Um, this this we can we can skip you know halfway through. Uh, so here is uh, age going. Uh, I know it's a little weird, you know, in uh, in in the Google Meet. It's look a little choppy. I promise it's a nice full twenty four per second, twenty four frame per second video. Right. So uh, here's skin tone. Our, our skin tone was condensed uh, to a three point scale, which is light, medium, and dark. Uh, here we have gender, it's perceived gender, so uh, we condense our code book down to only uh, two, which is uh, uh, women and men. Um, this is what we have in our V1. Uh, but the best part of all of this is that because we're using a multitask model, all of this kind of happens at a single time with a single pass through the film. And so we're getting, at a single time, gender, skin tone, age, and body type. And you know, in this demo, you can see that we're doing body type, which is in the bottom right, for all of these scenes kind of automatically. All right, I think we're good to skip through this demo. Thank you. All right, and now um, Krishna is going to introduce the question that we came up with in our group. That's my cue, thanks, Caroline. Um, yeah, so in, in, our, in the round table, we mostly discussed the lingo and the language to use and when talking about body type and the word fat. Um, and one of the first questions we discussed is measuring body size. Um, how, how is it dif different or similar compared to measuring other identity attributes uh, like race and gender? Um, and why is, it, why is there so much stigma attached to it? Um, and then uh, we talked in, in, some, in some detail about reclaiming the word fat um, and, and making making this identity attribute real um, so uh, we can have a conversation about it. And one of the action items that came out of our discussion was, um, can we how, how can we create an unconscious bias test to measure fat phobia and sizeism? Um, this came out primarily when we were discussing about, uh, say, deploying a model which, can, uh, which predicts body type of people um, for, say, a health insurance website. Um, uh, it may, it may introduce bias into the system. At the same time, it may also be used as a tool to catch unconscious biases 
in uh, people interacting with their in, with the health insurance system. So these are some of the questions we discussed. I'd like to open it up for uh, discussion and comments. So there's a question in the chat, I think, right. about the tool. Um, did you want to address that, Nathan? Yeah. Um, so if there's a specific kind of bias that you had in mind with this question, feel free to jump in. Uh, I think for me, you know, the big, the big important part of this data set was that every single task was kind of aware of the other tasks. And so we didn't just, you know, choose a uh, large body type people that were only, you know, light skin tone or male, we tried to kind of address a really diverse set of data um, for all of our tasks. And that includes uh, body type. Uh, we also did a task with our research team where we had uh, the face only, and we wanted to see if uh, our researchers kind of kind of go through and you know check all these four tasks using only the face, and we found really high accuracy with that. And so uh, that kind of you know motivated us to continue using just the face for this sort of development. I don't know, um, you know, if there's anything else, yeah, feel free to address any other bias that you're thinking of. But we tried to make this as unbiased as possible. Well, and the numbers are in the nine, you know, 95 and above, right? So it means that at least in terms of those variables, it's the tools really accurate, but perhaps there's some other biases in measuring other aspects that Victor might be thinking of. Yeah. I, Can we read the word fact? <laughs> Sorry. I saw you had your hand up, Dylan, but did you yeah. just put it oh. <laughs> yeah, I was I was wondering, this is something that I've been thinking a lot about and, and trying to bring up. Um, and I'm I'm looking into like getting human labelers to like categorize people's like different body sizes. And I was wondering like one, how do you like give instructions to labelers or like understand like how did you you know define categories and also sort of move past that discomfort, both with labelers and with other like researchers in talking about this kind of issue. So I can address that, but other folks should jump in as well. Um, so we actually start uh, with our with our human coders. We actually use a five point scale, not a three point scale. Um, and of course, that it's it's easier to put things into categories if there are fewer categories. Um, so it's a little more difficult with the five point scale. But we really we have good high and a rate of reliability on it. But it did take a while uh, because probably Dylan because of what you're pointing out, which is this like lack of comfort with it. So um, we have um, very thin, somewhat thin, middle of the road. Uh, you know, somewhat large, very large. And then we also have this other category, which is um, very athletic or muscular, which actually is not on that spectrum um, in order to capture kind of that nuance. And if it has to be put into that, into the five point scale, we would we would put it in the middle um, because it would be it, it wouldn't be thin and it wouldn't be in, in terms of what we're measuring. Um, so we we have really specific and we have specific instructions, but I don't actually think that that's I think that there's a pretty there's a pretty good understanding of fatness and and thinness. What we did have to do though is anchor it when we're talking about media representations. Make sure to anchor it to the the real world rather than the Hollywood world because Hollywood world is a size zero for women and the real world is you know a size twelve on average for women. Becca. Yeah, and I think to address the ickiness of and the discomfort with assigning that, our coders are have I think gotten used to that because we we have to do a lot of other variables that are similar like one for instance is appearance where we're judging based on like the societal standard of appearance in order to see um who gets who is shown attractive across the different identities um but the thing that's interesting to me is once our coders and the team kind of gets past the fact that it feels really uncomfortable to assign those that those variables tend to have the highest level of intercoder agreeability. Carol, Caroline, if you wanted to step into, but we end up getting the higher the highest numbers of accuracy in those categories over ones that feel a lot better to assign. Um, I don't know if there's a better way of saying that, but I just found as a research team manager, I found that really interesting. Yeah, you would think with latent coding where you have it would feel like there's a lot of subjectivity in something like attractiveness or body size. Um, but maybe, 
I don't, I mean, I have theories as to why this is the case, but there is actually a lot of common agreement. Uh, obviously it would shift over time, but um, you would think, well, well, we'll never be able to place these five people in terms of attractiveness on this scale. And yet in this group, we, we have found um, that we would have very high reliability, um, which, I mean, what, what is validity when you're talking about, I guess you're measuring, you know, hege hegemonic uh, beauty. Um, so it, it is odd how much agreement we have about these, uh, what feel like subjective measures. I think Amrutha, did you raise your hand? Uh, yeah. Um, so this is just a question from like the ML point of view. So when you're doing something like body type from phase, what features are you really looking at? Like, are you hoping that the landmarks capture this or? Um, uh, you know? No, I mean, we're really just, you know, sending this through a, a standard feed forward net. Um, we're not we're not doing any sort of landmark piece. We want to be able to kind of capture all angles of a face and, and any, you know, side angle or kind of the back angle. There's a, there's a lot of strange angles. And we found if we did this sort of landmark uh, adjustment and we would get lower coverage on films, which is not what we wanted to do. Um, you know, I know, I know I've already said this, but I think going back to like having this proof of concept with our research team, ensure that we they could do uh, this manual labeling of faces, even in strange positions where we could only see half the face, I think really built up confidence that this was something that was able to kind of automate. Could it also be because of like, for instance, stereotypes of casting or something else? Like, have you have you looked at like other factors that might affect portrayal of like yeah, large so, body types? So while we've trained on movies and TV show data, uh, you know, what wasn't on the slide is that I've evaluated on real world images of people with large body types and, you know, kind of out in the wild of pictures of people with dark skin tones and you know all of our different tasks kind of seeing if this all if these results that we had also held up in in the wild pictures um i don't have actual metrics so you'll just have to take my word for it uh i, I think it holds up really well uh i i think the way that we've hand curated this data set to kind of be as really representative as possible and we didn't just take the top five you know tv shows on google that said large body type but this was really really a lot of thought into this data set I think really helped it apply towards this nice general, you know, real world um, data set. Um, I, I understand. I think what I'm trying to say is like, it would also be interesting to know what in this data set is the algorithm capturing? Yes. Like what um, exactly, like, uh, because it's one thing to know, like you can do this with like a hand curated data set, assuming you have a bunch of faces randomly scraped off the internet. Can you now try and replicate this work there? Um, right. But just, just a thought. Yeah. Yeah. That is some interesting analysis that we're going to do. Uh, I just retrained the final version of this algorithm this morning. So uh, there's going to be a lot of analysis uh, before we start deploying this and using it. Uh, but that is a good one. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you guys. This was another um, very exciting conversation and, and super exciting to see, um, you know, the, the tool that, that you are all are building at the, the Gina Davis Institute. Um, so I think I had in the schedule uh, a 10 minute break, which I assumed would get shortened. So let's take about five minutes and regroup at 1120. Um, and we'll move on to the last two um, conversations of, of the day. So thank you all. Just take a few minutes.
Um, it's 11.20. If we want to start coming back, we can move on to the next presentation. So the uh, session, sorry for the motorcycle driving down my street. This is the <laughs> session on um, understanding conflict and abusive language hosted by Wendy Chun. And I believe, Jillian, you're going to be presenting, right? I am, yes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm Jillian Russell. I'm a designer and postdoctoral fellow at the Digital Democracy. Democracies Institute, which is led by Wendy Chun. And so um, for today, I sort of going to present what we did in the workshop and really that we sort of started to, or we didn't start, we approached this workshop as an opportunity to throw out a provocation to peers and colleagues to kind of see what their thoughts and imaginings would be on a topic that we're currently exploring in the lab. So which falls under the research stream from hate agonism. And so the questions we raised were, what knowledges and imaginaries are necessary to employ machine learning to create more responsive rather than retroactive or reactionary interventions to abuse? And how might we direct AI to engage in conflict to foster user and community-based empowerment to sort of understand the capacity of what emerges in conflict as a productive response to equitably intervene and redirect abusive conversations? So to give a bit of context, what we're working from is this notion that many of the standard approaches to moderation being used today begin from and respond to explicitly abusive encounters of speech. So this means intervention only has a means of intervening retroactively to abuse sort of after the harm has already been done. And that current models of moderation institute policy in reaction to particular issues or terms that have come to be representative of harm. So again, this kind of idea of reactionary responses. So situating moderation as post hoc responses to abuse does not mediate um, harm in the first account. And it inadvertently, as has been shown by current moderation research, closes down conversations and disproportionately affects those it aims to protect. So the provocation we put out in the workshop really stems from a larger question we're asking in the lab, which is how can AI be better deployed to foster democracy by integrating freedom of expression, commitments to human rights, and multicultural participation in the protection against abuse. So looking to create alternative data literacies and paradigms for connection, to design applications that will transform hostile social media exchanges into productive dialogues, and perhaps most importantly, to offer those who are most frequently in harm's way more tools to support um, more tools or support in context. So through our research into abuse and also counter speech, we kind of have come to this understanding that conflict um, is something that exists in both these spaces. And so we have really started to see conflict as this middle ground between abuse and resolution. And so we've therefore shifted our attention sort of directly away from abuse and towards conflict. This idea of beginning with conflict aims to preserve the complexity of dialogue and the necessity of dissensus to democracy. And it really tries to understand what kinds of conventions, subjects, or cultures of speech um, tend to act as conduits for abusive or toxic speech dynamics. So rather than taking instances of abuse as the starting point, looking for prior indications of conflict or tension as the site with which intervention ought to begin. And so really looking at mapping conflict as this way to find spaces of opportunity to intervene, to be able to create these sort of spaces of agonism or opportunities for democracy. Um, slide two, please. So we started the workshop loosely presenting our first layer of the conflict coding schema that we're working on in the lab, um, which was developed from literature on conflict language and performativity. And so I'm not really gonna spend too much time going through this, but effectively um, the idea was to develop or is to develop conflict coding schema for the study of abusive language, kind of moving away from the study of abusive language that relies mainly on hate-based vocabularies instead of recognizing abusive language after the fact, we're aiming to learn as it develops to kind of gather contextual signals and speech patterns. And so what we've done right here is sort of this, um, you can sort of see a series of key dimensions for understanding conflict. And these kind of range from the type of medium or communication platform that we're sort of looking into, um, sort of embracing this idea of certain affordances that might come and be designed into the platforms themselves, sort of looking for is the conflict latent or reactive? Um, what's the distribution of power, types of conflict, modalities of conflict? Where is the conflict arising from? Formats of conflict, um, stances of behavior, and then in landing on kind of responses to conflict as a way to understand whether it's productive or unproductive. Next slide, please. 
And so what I've done here is sort of map out the conversations that we had in the workshop, focusing on key concepts, questions, and considerations that were raised throughout the session. So I'll spend a few minutes talking through this before we open it up to discussion. And so um, one of the first concepts that were really discussed was this idea of thinking through the possibilities and imaginings of a moderation tool for agonism. And so questions that came from this were sort of how can computational tools be used to care for democracy? Really thinking through this idea of a shift from antagonism to supporting agonism in online social media spaces to better, to better facilitate for debate, discussion, and exchange. And so um, a consideration that came from sort of this concept specifically was this idea of how do we understand how to live in difference, to kind of respect difference rather than elide it. So really understanding the failure in homophily and starting to think through how we can support and embrace and sort of teach this idea of living with difference um, through our tools. Another consideration was sort of giving agency to those who need it most. And so really thinking through who are these moderation tools for, who have access to them, and who are going to be able to sort of enact them. And so momentarily it sits within corporations and how can we actually start to really design these tools for the users themselves to be able to um, you know, sort of hold the agency and the ability to sort of enact them. And so this then brought on ideas of tools for counter speech, and then also the affordances of what some of these tools might have and, a, and the idea of supporting notions of kind of respect, civility and diplomacy. Another element that came from this idea of thinking through or imagining moderation tools for agonism was the idea of what role um, artistic practice might have in this exploratory research to really think through the possibilities that sit within this kind of format to not only bring forth notions of education and literacies, but also for the ability to embrace notions of failure and absurdity. So the second concept that we really um, sort of grappled with in the workshop was this idea of actually the definition of conflict and it's sort of understanding conflict as kind of a struggle between opposing forces, but through understanding it through kind of speech, language and gesture. And so this is the idea of um, being able to map conflict in kind of face-to-face -face interactions. And so some of the questions that came from that is how can computational tools be used to understand these rich dynamics and what tools could be used to do this? And some of the considerations were sort of understanding online social cues and so online layers of performativity and is there ways to start to be able to map these and really understand the kind of cues that they're giving off. And so one of the examples that was brought forward is the idea of all caps as kind of encapsulating this kind of um, effective response. Um, to a particular dialogue. And then another uh, concept that came about was this idea that we had originally sort of, as I showed in the coding schema, started from a sort of performance-based idea of language, looking at kind of audience script and cues. And what was mentioned in the workshop was this idea of what happens if we start from something like TV or film to explore how to build these tools. You know, there's been a certain performative, um, understanding and enactments of conflict within that particular or these particular mediums and could we be using these as mechanisms to better understand and explore how we might build these tools in online spaces. So another um, concept that we looked at was typologies of conflict with questions of how do we define what is productive versus unproductive conflict and so how do we better understand and start to grapple with this in looking through sort of uh, dialogues and discourses in online spaces. How do we direct speech towards productive utterances? And really kind of starting to consider this idea of understanding the difference in conflict between asynchronous and synchronous enactments, which goes back to this notion of face-to-face -face versus online interaction. Temporality of conflict was also brought up and this idea of what about, what about tracking conflict across platforms with the sort of considerations of how subcultures build community and enactments across platforms as tools for sort of reinforcement and what might that provide us as better understandings of how we might um, not only map conflict but understand how we could create these tools to support as well as opportunities to create sort of democracy and agonistic exchange. And then lastly was the idea of the importance of stance. And so really looking at sort of intentions and the stance of sort of the actors um, involved in sort of conflict and questions of how to code for hierarchies, how to code for changes in affect and what that means and requires to understand. And so this again was considerations of sources versus target of the actions. 
Um, online conflict is not always understood from both sides and so need to know the intention of both parties and how can we do that within online spaces. And then lastly, this idea that sort of community audience context and history um, need to be understood as fundamentally embedded within the text. And so that this is really um, sort of uh, in, embodied within this, these kind of notions of affective responses um, to particular kind of conversations. And so that's sort of where we got, it was quite a rich discussion and it was by no means ended. It, we, we could have gone on for hours and hope to sort of meet again at some point to carry on the conversations. Um, but last slide, please. But at this point, I think it'd be great to hand it off to all of you. And so I've just left here the kind of key provocation that we brought to the workshop. Again, how might we direct AI to engage in conflict, to foster user and community-based empowerment, to understand the capacity of what emerges in conflict as a productive space, to equitably intervene and redirect abusive conversations. Thank you. Hey, Julian. Hey. Hi. Uh, great talk um, and discussion. I, I wanted to kick off some uh, discussion about if you uh, thought about what productivity would mean in such interactions and conversations and uh, what aspects of it should we be considering uh, thinking about uh, online discussions. Perfect. Does someone else in our group want to also join in. I don't want to be the only one speaking for all of us. <laughs> I mean, we did talk through productivity, absolutely, and I can certainly say that, but maybe Wendy, you would like to speak to this as well? Um, sure, that was Cree's question, actually, um, as we were discussing. So, uh, and then I nicely flipped it back onto Cree, but I think <laughs> that what we, uh, what is important for this project is to use these tools in an exploratory manner so rather than saying we know in advance what is productive or unproductive, to say actually we don't um, given the complexity of conflict. So to what extent by mapping and thinking through this, can we think of different modes of productivity? And here we were also really inspired by Sarah's work um, with her um, uh, fembot and the ways in which say wasting time or occupying can actually be a productive mode. So perhaps Sarah, you could talk about your project. Sure. Um, I have a chatbot that tries to explain feminism to misogynists on Reddit, uh, particularly in spaces like the red pill in cell communities. And obviously going into something like that, the premise is not that it's going to change people's minds um, or that it's going to be able to cover all of that ground. So we talked about productivity having a lot of different faces so that it might be you know distracting someone from being in the comments of a female journalist's article somewhere else um it might be um raising ire instead of educating might be a different kind of productivity where a different bot might be having a, a de-escalating conversation or where i as a human might only be able to have a role where i felt safe de-escalating something like a a a an automated system might be able to take on a different role that could be productive in a different way. So that sort of experimental artistic intervention could treat failure as a, or absurdity as a different kind of productive intervention. I think um, like, you know, I was I was really inspired by by Sarah's project when, when she was uh, uh, explaining in the introduction. I think that's something that, well, first of all, I was also really inspired by your summary of our conversation and the map that you drew for us, Jillian. That's pretty impressive. But um, you know, I think I think you know, sort of to your point, Wendy, of like this being you know the tools being sort of this exploratory process. I I, I love this idea of like sort of like using this artistic mode, you know, of exploration in, in, in your work, Sarah. And, and, and similarly in the idea of like, 
you know, turning to like media and sort of stage and theatrical conflict as a way of like exploring some of this as well before we sort of like, you know, kind of release these things into the wild, so to speak. So I, th I think that's a very interesting, um, you know, like sort of perspective that that was present in, in this conversation. Um, yeah, no, no question, just to comment. There. But I did see Amrita, were you coming off mute and about to, to say something? Uh, yeah, uh, really great work and uh, really nice presentation. Uh, uh, I was I was sort of just thinking about like I think this sort of came up in our uh, discussion too about um, how you can sort of uh, characterize different interactions like wherever they may be and um, I was wondering like you said you know one of the things you talked about was how to catch these things early or like understand like where the conversations may be going. And um, I was wondering what your thoughts are on that. Like, you know, say this is in some, not like in an online context, but like in a media domain or whatever, um, like, would we be able to still do some of this um, effectively? I don't know. Does that make sense? So one way that, um, so first of all, I've been so inspired by the presentations before us. And part of what we were trying to think through is that intersection between interaction, character, um, speech. Um, and so again, taking a very um, rich as well as audience, um, almost performance-based understanding of social interactions themselves. And one thing that was key to us is the notion that interaction changes character. That what's so interesting about conflict is that as a conflict proceeds or resolves, what happens is that um, not only is the affective tenor of the conversation changed, but the characters themselves fundamentally change. So it's it's from the you know the fundamental insight that identification processes of identification actually destabilize identity, um, and so. From that, right, and thinking through the, these notions of um, destabilizations, where the interaction is something which um, fundamentally um, changes what's unfolding, for us was to to say, okay, if this is what we're interested in, then we need a larger schema, um, which we've been thinking through in terms of you know character, um, script. Um, audience, et cetera. Um, but then starting from moments of human coding of um, saying, okay, this is an uh, important conflictual moment, um, saying, okay, for it, to use a textual example, it would be say a racial slur, right? Um, as one point to start from. The question would be, okay, why is this racial slur um, effective as a slur, okay, it would be because through this slur, one is actually citing and engaging with a community of others who use this slur. Um, and that fact that one joins a community um, is key to uh, how mm -hmm. it is um, affecting the target, right? And then from there to understand the, the question of audience and of history. So trying to use that, that um, that moment that we can catch, especially within social media, to draw out these other forms. And then from this, seeing what can be, uh, how can we use machine learning and other tools to, um, to open up this picture? Yeah, I, I, I also really like how you sort of frame the flip side of the question. This is just a comment, but I think there's like so much focus on like identifying the negative stuff, but you sort of forget that these things escalate over time and space and um, it's like almost always not linear so yeah just just a comment thanks again if there's one more comment maybe we can take that before moving on to the next group Otherwise, then thank you, Wendy and Jillian, for this work that you're doing and, and for the lovely summary of the, the conversation. 
And so let's move on to our last, but certainly not least presentation on um, identity and subjectivity in relationships and interactions. Uh, the host was Jed Brubaker of the University of Colorado Boulder. And um, I guess Jed and Kylie will both be presenting the results of this conversation. Thanks, Cree. Um, let me go ahead and echo what um, Wendy was saying about how inspiring the previous um, presentations have been. Um, in Jillian, including your own. Um, and hopefully we can pick up on that and tie some threads together. We asked Cree for a last minute refresh because we were seeing some ties. I'm gonna do some quick stage setting and then turn it over to Kylie to like give us the juicy stuff. Um, for context, I um, am the director of the Identity Lab at CU and that means like this is like my favorite place to be. Thank you all. Can I get next slide? Um, and what I'm hoping we can think about and discuss today is how the way we organize the world and represent it in our systems might not actually be how we actually experience the world. So for example, I, you know, you know that I'm now from CU and so maybe I have this identity here and Cree, can you give me next slide? But actually it's not just one identity. You all kind of now have a copy of my identity. And this is one way we can start to think about identity as being intersubjective. Um, that like, I don't get to control what you go off and say about me after we're done. Hopefully it's good. Um, so, you know, is it really my identity? Do I get to control it? Who knows? Next slide. And so in the name of um, a crappy model, because you know they're all wrong, but some are useful, you might think about if we're going to put relationship first, that like maybe there's me and there's stuff I have internally, maybe there's stuff I have externally, there's you and there's like this relationship. And when we were thinking about questions of identity, we can kind of think at any of those different layers. Next slide. And this sits actually in contrast with how we typically have thought about uh, identity when it comes to our technical systems, which arise from computer security and a history of authentication and record keeping. And even the concept of the user, which ostensibly has, has given us all control over our representations, actually still reinforces this idea that there's a single you. Um, and it really comes from a governmentalized approach to identifying identification, identification paper, passport, and not actually how we experience identity in our social interactions and in the real world. So a uh, provocation I might start you with uh, before I hand it over um, is what if we, instead of thinking about uh, identity as a prerequisite for interaction, like I have to have uh, you know, a Google account so that I can log into Gmail, what if we thought about identity as the byproduct of interaction, as the thing that interaction itself produces? So let me hand it over to my co-pilot. Hi, so for some context, I'm Kylie. I'm a software engineer here at Google on the Muse team with Cree. Um, and for this first point, some more context is I write code, but I also write poetry and memoirs. Um, and so when I was previously in a relationship with a scientist, I felt like an artist. And then when I was in a relationship with an artist, I felt like the scientist. And what does that mean? Why did that change? I was still Kylie the whole time. Um, so this kind of brought us to this idea that identity is, situ is situational and a byproduct of our relationship with others. And so we really need to reconsider how we label ourselves and these identities. And it's not, it's not binary. It's not a one-to-one, -one, right? We, all of these things are on a continuum because, you know, for me, I can be both a scientist and an artist, or maybe I'm neither. Um, and so a lot of times labels often will act as proxies uh, that that get in the way of more interesting patterns. And one thing that we got into it with our conversation is things like race, a race label in a data set. And so even if you remove a race label, you might still be able to get race from confounding factors. And so is race really the thing in control of it uh, at here, or maybe is it socioeconomic status or or other other things like that? Um, and and we also had a lot of discussion about how labels change over time. Perhaps the way you label yourself changes over time. Perhaps when you're in a new relationship, your labels change. Perhaps society's idea of a label changes, and thus you no longer, you know, you no longer feel that that that, that is correct or that's not the role you play with others. Um, and so this change 
is a big challenge in media understanding. Um, and then let's go to the next slide. So as, as the second group was going, Jed had this great idea to revisit the character maps. Um, so we saw this earlier with Rayon and Rayon's father and this idea of, of these labels being on them, but then there being these interpersonal connections. And um, next slide. If we take away those labels, um, we can start to ask, like, how should we really detect and classify these relationships? The taxonomy is super important because where are those attributes really? Um, can you go to the last slide? So if we wanna think about interaction being the driver of identity, we wanna reconsider where these connections are made and where we anchor these labels and attributes. And so perhaps the labels are not inherently tied to Rayon or his father, but instead they are a byproduct of the interactions that involve the two. So perhaps the label humble is, is not what Rayon is, but when he's willing to go to his father and ask a question or ask for advice, he takes on an aspect of humility. And in social science, we might then ask the question, is he humble or does he act humble? And if it's that he's acting humble, can we ascribe such a label to him? Or is it something to be ascribed to that interaction? Um, and so I think we really ended on this idea if what if we changed our approach to only applying labels to a subject after we see them interacting with others? Uh, and I think that really resonates with, with a lot of things that we were all speaking to. Um, and it's, it kind of makes you really think the big questions of like, what is our sense of self, if not, if not the comparison to, to those around us? Um, yeah. So. That was great, Kylie. Hannah and Susanna, are there other things that you think you would like to add in? I kind of have a small, intimate crew. It was really fun. <laughs> I'm seeing a no shake. Well, then we're happy to discuss. This was a, a really great reframing and like just like incredible kudos to both of you for like grabbing those earlier slides and rearranging them like this so quickly. I don't, I don't, you pulled it off. It was, it was wonderful. Um, you know, there's a project that this reminds me of that is um, sort of you know, from a completely different sort of sphere of interest of mine, kind of in um, some folks that are, you know, kind of tangentially interested in sort of the blockchain crypto economics kind of space, right? Where, you know, there's a lot of like, like one of the biggest challenges for a lot of this, like, you know, crypto economy, like decentralized, you know, governance kind of stuff has been how do you like identify people? Right. Like there isn't like a decentralized solution for identifying people. And I was at a, a, a conference. And I think it was 2019. <laughs> yeah, I think that's right. Um, in this sort of uh, area. And, and there was a paper they presented a solution where, you know, the your identity was essentially just this like journal of like interactions and events that like you have so you just record this history of events like your you know maybe your phone is automatically recording like where you were on October 3rd you know 2010 and has some GPS record and maybe you know there were some other phones in the vicinity that could verify that you were there right and so then you know, to verify your identity is to say, okay, give me, you know, where you were on these dates. And then, you know, you go off and very, you know, there's some crypto magic and you know stuff that happens behind the scenes, but it, it was very interesting. I really like this idea of sort of like, you know, taking away this notion of like, that the identity is something, some like, you know, fixed attribute associated with you. And instead it's sort of like, the collection of all these interactions and relationships you've had. And just like one final thought on that project was like some of the criticism was like, well, then, you know, like 
people could have multiple identities, right? They have multiple phones that have had multiple histories. And in fact, the the authors, and I think, you know, I, I sort of share their view is that, well, we all actually do have multiple identities, right? Like I have the identity that I share with my family, the identity I share with my coworkers, the identity I share with my friends, you know, when I'm making music or whatever, right? And like, they're all, you know, maybe related, but but not identical. Can I jump in with a question? Um, and I don't really quite know what it is, but uh, I, so I'm on a panel tomorrow where I'm uh, talking about the quantification of intersectionality, right? And just taking two notes of intersectionality and is it, you know, it could be additive, it could be multiplicative, it could be logarithmic, it could be, it could actually be negative. One could actually counter the negative effects of, of another, like, you know, Barack Obama's blackness actually causing his brand of masculinity to be less stigmatized. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to wrap my brain around all of this. And and then it's situational based on region and time and all of these other variables, right? And you've, you have now taken that entire model, which this is amazing, right? Uh, and you're saying, well, maybe it's not even that, right? Like maybe it's it's more, it's so much more complex than the infinite complexity that it, that we've already discovered. So this is my long way, really long way of asking about the politics of this. What I have encountered in talking about this is the pushback from moving it away from both self-identification and the individual. And so how are you thinking about that? How are you grappling with that? Thanks for that question. Um, I, you know, there's these kind of three questions that we run around with in um, our lab. We ask like, what is it? Why is it so? And what if it were different? And so our impulse here actually um, resonated, uh, had me resonating a lot with um, the previous presentation where it's like, there's almost a kind of a playful quality we have here where it's like a, what if we just rethink the modeling here? Like, what if it were different? And, and, and the answer, Caroline, is I actually don't know, right? And I think my first impulse is to point it, why do we keep going back to this governmentalized, document-based approach? And why are we so insistent on it? Well, and, and of course, it's because it does a lot of work for us. Um, but I think we're running into certain limitations. And so I'm at a place now where I'm thinking playfully about well, what if we were to do it differently? Hence, like the taxonomies of interaction, super fascinating. Like, you know, let's choose any one of them and play with them. It's kind of where my my knee jerk would be there. I haven't thought a lot about the politics here beyond the um, beyond thinking through the insistence around individualism versus more kind of collectivist ideas. When you think about um, does the like, you know, if you think about, you know, quintessential collectivist culture, then this attribute actually can't only be held by a person because it kind of ricochets or expands or scopes out to others. Um, and so like that might be a different way of us thinking that again, our technical infrastructures tend to not really reflect. And so I kind of find that, that disconnect between the technical and the social fascinating. That's my way of thinking through it. Doesn't give you an answer, especially not for tomorrow though, sorry. Um, Jed, uh if I could, so what's so fascinating about this is that it recalls a lot of um, philosophical work precisely around questions of subjectivity, right? You can think of Nietzsche's argument that it's the action and the subject comes later. Um, but you could also think through, and this goes to the question of the politics, um, some of work by um, within queer studies and um, Judith Butler and others around performativity, which would then say the repetition of this act is actually what makes certain identities appear um, to, to be intersectional or permanent or et cetera. So it would it be really fascinating in this diagram to think through um, the action, but also the repetition, the habitualness mm -hmm. of it, um, to what extent that this becomes a habitual ask versus a non-habitual ask. One could also think through, and, and that would get to some of the politics of it, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I absolutely love that. And something that um, did come up yesterday, and that's when we had our roundtable, is um, I was talking about Mark Poster's work around databases, which like I draw so much inspiration from, and think about databases as kind of a calcification of that repetitive performance. We're also doing some 
completely, well, I guess now not completely unrelated work in the lab where we've been looking at um, machine learning, computational social science approaches to detecting things like eating disorders. And we've been actually turning to queer phenomenology to rethink how we might do a label down approach versus how someone's experience is set up in the ecology around the table and the perp like what it means to have those repeated actions um, in the ways that you know Sarah Ahmed is clearly referencing Butler. So no, I'm right there with you. Um, I put this chart together in like literally 30 seconds or less. So I, I, now I have a call to go add in some layers. I also had a comment. Um, I thought this was super fascinating and actually sort of wearing my designer hat. Um, it really brings up ideas of personas. And so in design, we always do design to personas, right? And that's fundamentally taking stereotypical ideas of identity and then programming them into our tools. And if you kind of look at this idea of an ontology, you know, we make things and things in return make us, it puts us in this perpetual cycle of we use identity to design our tools that therefore come back and reinforce our identities. And so I think this idea of shifting where we place these attributes is actually super fascinating in respect to how that then might us to invite our invite us to design our tools differently and so you know wendy sort of mentioned bringing something else into this and i wonder if context or situatedness is also something you've thought through you know you're talking about the idea of the interaction being where identity is placed and i wonder if you've also thought through this notion of kind of the situatedness um, or the context as well and how that might um, work as a space to actually place identity I'd welcome feedback on this. Um, I half of my training, well, I guess a third of my training is in like psychology, personality psychology, and then there's this media cultural studies component, and it ended up being bifurcated in my brain, um, where I, you know, am thinking about interaction producing self identity. Um, but you know, sometimes in our lab we're talking about should this model be, you know, we're doing a model of like gender classification. Um, does, should it be bound to a particular region? where people view, see, and understand gender differently. And so I've been thinking, like that's kind of where we've been thinking about it. Um, but I, so I'm there with context. I'm, I'm not sure when, where, and it's kind of floating around in our work right now, but clearly um, important. Uh, I think there's kind of an analytic maneuver that we end up doing in our lab a lot. I think one of the first papers I read as a PhD student was work on extreme users. Um, and if people aren't familiar with this, like go look it up. It's like, what if we design, take like a smartwatch and design it for completely antisocial, inappropriate things and make those the personas? Like, let's design for a drug dealer. Or like these total wacky, not pro-social things to see how the normative assumptions in our designs break down. Um, and so I find myself always looking for those kind of scenarios um, with kind of a designerly impulse. Um, other people in the group, thoughts about thoughts about how context fits in this? Well, context formats relations as well, right? It produces the parameters for interaction. Um, and so it, it immediately imposes limitations or um, you know, funnels exchanges through uh, particular epistemological positions, methodological positions, um, ontological positions. So I think the situatedness can also impose upon the interactions of themselves. Um, thinking through even the example of the conflict group before, one of the things um, that, sorry, uh, in terms of that project, but is also looking at, sorry, I'm speaking to this because I'm also a part of that project, is, um, is the way platforms actually, what is a conversation in, in, on, on Twitter? Because you know you would have some folks that say there is no conversation on Twitter, um, but clearly there is a conversation happening and people are participating in it. So it might not be what we typically assume um, or would think of as a dialogue, uh, but certainly uh, something is happening there. And so in what ways do the sort of, um, does that formatting take place uh, and already predetermine uh, the, the sort of stakes of interaction uh, would be one thing that I would contribute on that. Well, thank you everyone. This was um, just an in incredibly inspiring conversation and yeah, in the the our session on um, 
Wednesday, we felt like we could have gone on for hours and I feel the same way right now. We could probably sit here and keep talking all day and I, I would be, I'd be happy with that outcome. But um, I do wanna be respectful of everyone's time and we're coming up at noon. So I wanted to give, uh, maybe we can all come off mute and give a round of applause to everyone and ourselves. <laughs> Um, one thing I did want to just mention that I, I forgot to up front. So like I said, we'll share these slides and, and maybe we can send out a follow-up email. But on, on the um, event page for this workshop, there is a link to sign up for um, the newsletter so that people can um, hear about upcoming events. I'm sure almost everyone on the call here probably is already getting those, but if you want to share that link with with others that that want to be informed of future events and and stuff that's going on here, that would that's one way to to stay in touch. But other than that, thank you all, and uh, have a lovely rest of your day. And hopefully, we'll see you all very soon. And uh, I think we can go ahead and stop recording now, Jim.